Welcome to CCA, those of you who haven't been here before. Um, it's a wonderful school and we have a really great uh, MFA and writing program, actually undergraduate writing program is great too. And we like to bring in um, wonderful guests and tonight is no exception. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Steve and then he's gonna do a little bit of setup about the film um, after Adderall. So, um, and thank you to Litquake um, for hosting this. Um, we really appreciate it. So I remember hearing about Steve before I met him. Um, he'd written a couple novels already. I was working at the time on a book about 9-11 um, and Cantor Fitzgerald and I was away a lot. I had this crazy deadline and I had a class at Continuing Studies at Stanford and Steve volunteered to take my class and, um, and my students loved him. I think they, they really didn't mind my being away as long as they could have Steve. So um, um, they said he was intense, which I agree that he had, and one thing I'll say about Steve, Steve has a brain that won't stop. He has tremendous energy, he has tremendous nerve. He said to our students before, that when he works, he's often in a race with his own enthusiasm. That's a tough race to win. Um, he has tremendous enthusiasm. He has tremendous courage. He's got a, a restless mind, I think, in many ways, moving from projects to projects, um, from form to form. When I think about the kind of career Steve has had, I think in some ways it's a little bit of Norman Mailer, a little bit of Hunter Thompson, combined with Mary Carr, um, which is a great combination. In the Bay Area, he was just a force, you know, we, I said this to my students that we just really miss him. He's such a center of things. He would hold these events when he was, before he was doing his political book, he would do, and it's, it's so timely to have Steve come during election season because he would have these great readings that, um, where we'd raise money for congressional races. And I think it was a way in which, a time in which we all bonded together as a writing community. You know, I, I didn't feel that connected to everybody, you know, before Steve would hold these events. Um, and this is before he started The Rumpus, before he edited all these anthologies where he brought writers together. So he's been a story writer, a novelist, he's been a war correspondent, um, a political correspondent, as I said, and then moved from that to, to writing really one of the great memoirs I can remember reading. I just, I, I had to call Steve the second I finished The Adderall Diaries to just to tell him, you know, I, how blown away I was by it. Um, it's just, it's such a wonderful book. Um, and then from there, you know, Steve uh, became a filmmaker and, and moved quickly from wanting to do it to writing, directing, and having suddenly all these movie stars in this movie. I, I, I showed up on the set and Steve is there and he's directing. I was like, what? You know, like he just sort of had this idea and Lily Taylor's taking notes from him. At any rate, um, this particular film is such an interesting project. He can tell you about it, but, but the, the idea of having someone make a movie, you know, essentially about your life. Uh, just a couple quotes from an article Steve wrote for New York Magazine. The truth is a lot more slippery than just facts, and disagreements frequently occur around the details. Truths are often personal, cobbled together from memories and interpretations of events. If memoirs were made up only of facts, they'd be very short, and there would be very few of them. When reading a memoir, we know we're reading an interpretation based on a faulty memory. We know the memory is faulty because we know all memories are faulty. If the author is introspective enough to know this too, we follow them on their journey. A good memoir reads like a detective story where the protagonist searches relentlessly and honestly for the truth. Um, I would say that that's true of how Steve has conducted his life as a writer and we're very honored to have him here at CCA. Please welcome Stephen Elliott. It's like one of those great experiences where you're like, oh, I'm so glad I stuck around long enough to be introduced somewhere by Tom Barbash. You know, it's like, all right, check it off the box. But pretty awesome. Um, so we're going to have a Q&A after the movie so we can do all any questions you might have then. And um, just a couple notes on the movie. Uh, I, well, I guess the one main note is that I'm naked in this movie. And I feel like a trigger warning, you know, like if I was going to send you a naked picture, I would first say, I'm going to send you a naked picture. Is that all right? So you should know that um, so you're not so taken aback. I mean, for a, a, a reasonable number of you, this is not the first time. But, uh, <laughs> but for the rest, um, uh, well, here, here it is. There's also three incredibly beautiful women that are naked in this movie, and nobody seems to complain about that. <laughs> it's like, nobody even, like, why is that? That's like not weird. Um, 
so yeah, this is this was you know this was a movie inspired by James Franco making a movie about me. It's a fictional movie. We made it for ten thousand dollars, so it's really ultra ultra low budget. And because so much of the footage is stolen, and because we don't have uh, contracts with any of the actors, screenings like this are actually the only place anybody can ever see it. We uh, the sc- the movie will never be available publicly or uh, online or anything. So it's just uh, so it's, it's really cool that you're getting to see it here on this like awesome screen and this great. Uh, theater space. So I guess we'll we'll start the movie now. I can start it over here. I think if uh, cut the lights. So great. Um, so Steve and I'll talk a little bit, and we might take a, some questions too. If that sounds good to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, why don't you talk a little bit about about I, I guess begin with with your feeling of watching yourself. Uh, being portrayed, you know, I, you wrote about it in Vulture, but for some of the people that um, that didn't read the article, to just talk about that that experience of actually seeing the movie. I was saying that uh, I don't know exactly how I felt when I saw the Adderall Diaries, but I clearly felt because then this wave of inspiration came across me to write this script and shoot it all very quickly, and it just kind of flowed out of me very easily. So. That's the only reason I know that it was very impactful to see a movie where I was, that was based on my memoir, was that it inspired me to do this. Otherwise, I wouldn't know. What was it like to see you <laughs> playing you, I guess? It's um, funny, you know, because I've directed these movies, <clears throat> directed movies before, but what I've realized, this is my first time ever acting. And it's like doing a play. Cause it's like I, when I'm, I feel like I've like performed in front of everybody. You know, as opposed to just like watching a movie that I directed, it's a very different experience, actually. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of. Uh, what was the, the the sort of inspiration behind making it such a film of ideas of of having? Um, I mean, this, it's much more intellectual, I guess, and and less. I mean, than Happy Baby, which is is um, you know, um, impactful and powerful, but but this idea of this this constant war of ideas. That, that go that runs through the film and it's very effective but how did you come up with that that idea of, of all these different voices and the, the sort of conversation that runs right through the film well I, I mean I think the main thing was you know I made two movies already I knew that nobody was going to ever give me money to make this movie and I've been watching a lot of Godard and those are the kind of movies I always like but I've always been afraid to make those kind of movies you know like Stardust Memories Pierre Le Fou, you know, my life is my life. And this I made with just $10,000, my own money, because I was working full time and I had saved up some money. So instead of buying a car, you know, I just decided I would make a movie. And so I wasn't even thinking really any of that. I was just like writing the movie that I wanted to see, you know, because I could just be, there was complete freedom, you know, and because it was so low budget, there was, we couldn't afford the SAG uh, deposit. So there's no contracts with any of the actors. There's no paper with anybody in the movie. So it's like a paper-free movie. And um, because it was non-commercial and I knew I could, ever, I could never legally uh, distribute it and so forth, it was just totally joyous. And, and it was just, we we're just all these people together just making art. You know, we just joined together and decided we were going to do this. And of course, once you're doing that, then everybody wants to be part of it. Because as long as nobody's getting paid, then nobody's getting screwed. You know, and then everybody wants in. Then it's this really cool, fun art project. And so, yeah, it was just super easy and fun and, you know. You know, you, you, the idea, there's the question in the film where you ask, where you're, um, um, uh, you're asked what a writer's life is like. And you, you, the answer is mm-hmm. that you stay alone often with your thoughts. Um, <laughs> at, can you talk about the difference between you know, writing your books and this collaborative process, you know, the, the joys, I guess, of coming up with a vision and then having someone who does the sound and the director and all the different people that, that appear that help you bring a vision into life. It's, like, it's, so, it's so different. It's so much less lonely, but then you also have, like, so uh, little control. Like, you really just kind of, like, guide it and hope it all turns out well. Like, a book is just, like, whatever you write, that's pretty much the book. And, but a movie, you can, you can mess up a movie at like a hundred different points. And a lot of them are not even in your control. You know, if you miscast a movie, you will never recover from that. There's nothing you can do to fix bad casting. And 
um, unless there's like there was one Woody Allen movie I think that he actually just reshot the entire movie. That's the one thing you can do to fix bad casting. Um, you can screw up a movie in the edit. You can screw up a movie in the sound mix. You know, and and all these people. I remember the first movie, the first time I made a movie and someone read, you know, a great actor read a line back to me and I realized that the actor actually made the script better and, like, my heart just swelled, you know, like, seeing someone, like, make your writing better than it actually is, is like, I was like, oh, well, that's what love is, you know, because I didn't know, you know, right. <laughs> and it was just so beautiful. So it's, it's this totally different thing, but you, you don't have control, you know, I mean, like, great directors with great scripts make really bad movies. It happens all the time. You know, so it's like th there's just still it's always a certain amount of luck if a movie turns out okay. And speaking of casting, people don't. It's his name is Bill Heck, right? Yeah, yeah. Bill Heck. And and Bill Heck plays essentially you in Happy Baby. Right? Yeah, Which is yeah. That's interesting. When I first worked with him. Right. Yeah. And he's, he's interesting because Happy Baby we made with two hundred thousand dollars, and it had s it was very difficult to make, you know, and I, and I think it turned out really well. It's really it's flawed and really dark, but this movie was ten thousand dollars, and I realized. The difference between the two is like I realize it's it's better it's easier to make a, mo a movie with no money than with not enough money. You That's know? interesting. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask you about the difference between if you had a several million dollar budget, what the advantages and disadvantages. Well, several million, the then you have more than enough money to pretty much make any movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know>? But <laughs> it, what I'm saying is, there's something about having that limitation of the ten thousand dollars that somehow made the film better, I guess, through the kind of ingenuity yeah. that you have to come up with. Yeah, so. definitely, it made it it made it much better, it made it much easier. Because then also I could like, I, I didn't have to have any producers and I could take a phone call from an agent because before I would never talk to an agent. But now if an agent wanted to talk to me about his actor or whatever, I could take the call because the answer was always no. You know, can I have more money? No. Can I get percentage of the movie? No. Because there's nothing. There's nothing to talk about and so it's very easy. It's like you either want to do it or you don't want to do it. There's no money, period. You know, there's a cake song in this movie mm -hmm. and, and when in the cafe and the manager of cake is like, so we can't, get any money? Like, no, you can't get any money. <laughs> you know, you can say no, and I'll respect that, but right. you can't get any money. Like, there's no money to be got. It just made everything really easy. And the, and the movie stars that you have in the film were not being paid a lot, correct? No, so. I mean, everybody was paid the SAG minimum generally, which is like between 50 and $100 a day. But I didn't pay Michael C. Hall because, you know, right. why? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? He's in for half a day. It's like, hey, Michael, here's 50 bucks. It's like, he doesn't care. He's so good. Yeah, yeah. he's such a cool guy, and he's so good. Such a, that was the very first scene that we shot. It's so my very first time acting. I was acting opposite Michael C. Hall. That was kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, so is that part of you that hurt, perhaps, you know, uh, with the whole process of being frozen out of this, the making part, the of The part this? of me that hurts is the entire me. Right. There's no part... Then the entire you, is it healed in part through, no. through making this? No. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I was, I was not, um, I don't think I was particularly hurt. I mean, they made the movie, and the director didn't want me on set, and I respected that. Like, whatever, she was a, she was a first-time director. Whatever she needed to make her comfortable is whatever she needed. I wasn't really upset. I don't think, I mean, as far as hurt goes, that's kind of low on the list. I, you know, like, I was already so damaged, I think, by that point, there's... That's not going to do anything. I mean, that's, you know, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, definitely it affected me, but I don't, you know, it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was that big of a deal. Like, I'm glad they made the movie. You know, I'm glad the Adderall Diaries movie exists. You know, I don't think it's a good movie, but, like, I'm glad it's there. You know, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say no. If I know what I know now, I wouldn't say, no, you can't make that movie. I'd still say, yeah, go ahead and make that movie that's not really going to be that good. You um, know? I think I really like the idea of seeing this after seeing Happy Baby as a sort of bookend, you know, the, of different parts of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because this is much more like a book. Yeah, but it but it also has so much of the Steve I've known over the last you know fifteen years, and your thought. There's so many of the conversations that that we've had and that you've had with maybe other people in the room seem to come to life in mm -hmm. the movie. So it really is. I mean, Happy Baby was. The you I didn't I didn't know I didn't I didn't I mean it I mean it, there's mm -hmm. parts of that that are still in you but I love I love the two of them one following them. I mean I think your next we'll have to probably make, wait ten years for you to live those years that you can write the next part of this trilogy yeah so, who knows yeah um, can we open it up maybe to a couple questions from the audience so yeah. Uh, 
Um, I mean, you know, Franco like played me in a movie. He also acted in a movie that I directed. Um, and yet, and we corresponded, uh, and we corresponded actually recently, like last week. But I don't think I know him at all. I have no idea how he feels about anything. I think he's unknowable, you know. Uh, you know, like, I mean, he sh when, I remember when he showed up on set for the first movie that we did together, you know, we talked for like an hour, and I explained the movie, and he was all into it. And then he showed up on set. He had no idea what the movie was about. He hadn't read the script. And, and, and I realized that that, that hour-long conversation we had, he had not heard of nothing. You know, he was just like shining on me, and he's a movie star, and so you're just like, you think he's really hearing everything, and he was not hearing a word. He was like playing some movie in the back of his head, you know, either watching a porn or something. I mean, it's just like totally was not there at all. I have no idea who he is or how he feels about anything, but we're on good terms. <laughs> you know, I wish him the best. Yeah. It's no, well, I mean, there's a couple reasons. I mean, the base reason would be, okay, you know, we use so many different cameras, and so it's very easy to make a match when it's all black and white, but that doesn't really matter anyway. It was more that it just, like, it's also the bigger thing is the 4-3 aspect ratio, right, which is the academy ratio, which why wow, it's kind of almost a square, and uh, which make, that signals that you're watching an art film, and I feel that it's very, you want to signal to people what the movie is, so, like, like I what happened with um, Jarhead, where they, they marketed it as this big action movie. And then uh, you went to see it, and it's like, oh, it's a movie about boredom. You know, and it's like, and everybody was disappointed with it. But if they had told everybody, hey, you're going to go see an art movie, then everybody might have enjoyed that movie. So it's actually very good, as long as you go in knowing what kind. And so I was really aware of that. And I just wanted to signal to people what kind of movie they were seeing. You know, uh, My Life is My Life and Stardust Memories are both black and white. And the 4-3 aspect ratio makes every frame look like a painting. And it focuses you on the character as opposed to the scenery. So that was it. It was mainly just like signaling what kind of movie you're watching. Okay. One more. Oh. Yeah. In the dark over there. Over there. Yeah. Um, you know, ideally, I'm bringing something to the audience that they can then add their own story to and walk away with, you know, their own story. I mean, the same thing with any of my books. You know what I mean? Like, ideally, I haven't told them what to think. I've inspired them to think more about things and come to new and interesting conclusions. Like, that's whenever I make a piece of art, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to, like, if, like, if, it, if I'm hitting somebody over the head telling them what to think, then to me that's failed art, you know. So whatever you take away from the movie is, a is accurate. I love, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the choice to have the writer's panel and then have this, this group of intelligent, interesting, including... Ben's daughter, right? You know, and they're asking these questions. But that idea of, I guess, bringing in storytellers and readers, in a sense, and having a, that, that kind of conversation in that kind of crucial part of the movie. Yeah, that was so fun. Well, one of the things was, in order to do the panel, we had to do an actual panel, right? Because we couldn't afford to do it otherwise. So we did it as a panel as a fundraiser for 826. And then we just shot it. We shot You'd it have for to like, uh, pay all the extras otherwise. Yeah, we just shot for half an hour beforehand and got some, li some extra lines, like the little girl and stuff. And then we did an actual panel, and then we just kind of edited it all together. Same thing in the bookstore. You know, in order to get, get the bookstore and do the reading, we just did a reading in a bookstore, you know, with Nick Flynn and Marie Howe. Um, and that's how, you know, it's just kind of how you do it when you're, like, hustling. But um, so it's, the panel is interesting because it's actually documentary. You know, it's like we didn't know what the panel was going to be like. And so we're, we're, we've got a certain number of lines that are scripted, and then we're intercutting the actual panel with the, the little bit of scripted stuff we had shot ahead of time. And that, was, that took a long time to edit and figure out, because like, the panel itself was like an hour. Yeah. And we had two cameras going, and like, I wish we had had a third, for sure. Um, but yeah, that was, that was fun. And Jerry Stahl, I think, is quite the actor. He's you great. Know? He's, so like yeah. the, our scene on the couch outside, which is just some couch we found under a bridge, and just pulled out into an alley. And like, 
let's just do it over, you know, just like nobody ever questions that. Like, why am I on a couch in an alley outside all the time? But um, Jerry, that, that scene was so tender with Jerry. Oh, it's fantastic. You know? Yeah, it's yeah. riveting. Um, anyway, it's, it's a wonderful film, and Thanks. thank you so much. This has been a great evening. Thanks, everybody, for, for sharing your Litquake evening with us, and come yeah, uh, celebrate the film. Come drink and hang out with it's Steven. Just a block away. Yep. So we'll, we'll show you. We'll be walking over. So, um, and thank you, Litquake. So this has been Thanks. great.